groups. We can also say that she's someone who not only didn't did have faith, but she was someone who contended for her faith as well. So she had a great faith, but she also contended for that faith. When it came down to it, remaining faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ is the calling that we all must be willing to contend for the faith. We all must want and desire to contend for the faith. What do I mean by that? Well, the little book of Jude helps us to understand that. Jude is the book that takes place, or that comes right before the book of Revelation. So if you want to turn there, it's only one chapter, so you'll hear me say, I won't say turn to chapter 1 or chapter 2, because there isn't a chapter 2. It's just all one. So it's one of those books that you can look at, and you can read just in a very short amount of time, and we're going to go through a large portion of it uh, here uh, this morning uh, so that we get an understanding of what it means to contend for the faith. We're going to take a little break, just one week break from our study in the book of Galatians. We'll go back to it next week. But as I was as I was sitting there uh, processing things at the Northwest Baptist Convention and then thinking about uh, Verlo's life and then when I saw that picture, Jeannie's life as well, uh, I couldn't help but think about uh, people like Verla, Jeannie, and the multitude of others throughout the Northwest Baptist Convention who faithfully gave us examples of what it means to contend for the faith. And so I really was, was stirred that I needed to bring this message this morning so that we would all know what it means to contend for the faith. So if you haven't already, turn to the book of Jude. Well, who wrote the book of Jude, and who did he write to? That's the first thing that we find here in verses uh, 1 and 2. So look what it says. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Now, we don't know much about Jude. All he says about himself is that he's a servant of Jesus Christ. In fact, the word that's used there in Greek is literally a slave. Now, when we think about slavery, of course, our mind automatically goes to very negative things. But the idea here is that, that he feels like he is a bond servant to Christ and, and, and a good master that he will serve with all of his heart, with all of his passion. It also says that he is the brother of James. This could mean that he was a half-brother of Jesus. We don't know for sure. He doesn't really spend a lot of time with that. But uh, since James was the brother of Jesus, it's, it's very possible that he was a half-brother of Jesus. It says also who he wrote to. He wrote to those who were called, beloved, and kept. Okay, again, look what it says. To those who are called, beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Now, it's most likely that he's writing to a church here, but it's relevant to all Christians because really it speaks of our past, our present, and our future. All believers are people who are called, beloved, and kept in Christ Jesus. Amen? So, so really, it's not just this church that he's writing to or this group of people. It's really all of us that this, this book applies to. Well, why did he write it? We find that in verse 3. Look what it says. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once uh, for all delivered to the saints. So his desire originally was to just write about the common salvation that they had, but he was moved that he needed to talk to something that he felt was more important at the time. And that really becomes his thesis statement of what he wants to tell. He wants his readers to contend for the faith. To contend for the faith. Now, when he says the faith here, that term means the entirety of the message that was taught by the apostles and held in common by the believers. As we've been looking through the book of Galatians, we've seen really the core teaching of the faith, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. As, I, as I've been saying throughout that, that study, and as I will continue as we continue in that study, that we have to get that right first. There's a lot of theological concepts that we learn when we start to study God's Word. When we really want to get into a deep study, there's a lot of theology. There's a lot of very interesting theology. There's theology where there's disagreement. There's, dis there's, there's theology where, where we don't really understand everything about it. 
But this is what we must get, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything else that we believe builds on that truth. That there is one way to salvation, and that way is through Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said it to himself, or said it himself. No one comes to the Father except through who? Through Jesus. It's just through Jesus. His death, burial, and resurrection is that core uh, moment that we see in, in history when God made a way where there was no other way that we could be in right standing, a right relationship, not because of our works, but because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So he tells them, contend for the faith. That are contend or defend the truths of Christianity against, the, uh, against them being deluded, or perverted, as we shall see. In fact, uh, he goes in the next section here, uh, and he's going to spend a lot of time talking about false teachers. In fact, a good portion of this letter is dealing with the teachings of the false teachers. Whatever this church is, whatever this church that he's writing to is, or maybe it's a multitude of churches that he's writing to, Whatever, whatever this group is, they were dealing with false teachers who were coming into the church and deluding and perverting the truth of the gospel. In fact, he says in verses 14 through 16, he says that they're ungodly, that they're sexually immoral, and that they deny Jesus. So these were not Christians. These weren't people who were just a little off base. These were people who even went so far as to deny who Jesus really is. Now, we're not going to look at every single one of those verses, but verse 19 uh, really sums up the false teachers well. He says in verse 19, It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. He says a number of things about them. They're they setting out to cause divisions. You want to find somebody who's going to cause problems in a church? Somebody who's set out to cause divisions? It's a red flag right off the bat. Does that mean that we're going to be agreeing on everything all the time? No. But there's a way that we deal with the divisions in the church, with the, the, the differences of opinion. We sit down, we have conversations, we learn, we give one another the benefit of the doubt. If someone's in sin, we go to that person. When we have differences of opinion, we, we understand what the difference is between a non-negotiable belief and other ones where it's like, well, there's some, there's some flex here. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father through, but through Him. That's a non-negotiable. What version of the Bible you use? It's up to you. You know what my favorite version of the Bible is? The one you'll read. I don't split hairs over that. Unfortunately, there are many people, even in our day, who set out to cause division in the church. That's a red flag right there. It talks about worldly people. People who spend a lot more time understanding the way of the world and living in the way of the world than spending time in the world. Spending time in the world. Often will say, and I'll, I'll probably even mention it again later on in the message, but God's, God's purpose must become our purpose. Amen. Or I've said it this way before, God's point in Scripture should become our purpose for our life. Doesn't mean we're not aware of what's going on in the world around us. I know a lot of the things that are going on in the world. I wish I didn't know a number of the things that are going on in the world around us. But you know what? We ought to be, we ought to know God's work much better. Because unfortunately, worldly people have a tendency to run towards worldly things. You'd be amazed on how many people believe that the Bible teaches that God helps those who help themselves. The Bible does not teach that. Nowhere can you find that. Unfortunately, worldliness too often creeps its way into the church. He says, to devoid of the Spirit, these are people who are not driven by the Holy Spirit. They're driven by a Spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. <coughs> well, 
we're not going to spend a bunch of time focusing on the false teachers, though, because really the focus here is, is what Jude says about contending for the faith. See, it's less important because the, the, the attitudes and the behaviors of the false teachers in that day, though there's some similarities, are different than what you'll find today. But the way that we contend for the faith is still the same. Historically, we'll find that throughout history, that's kind of redundant there, I said historically and throughout history, you get the idea though. Throughout history, you'll see that the church faced different types of attacks, different types of issues, different struggles. I remember when I first started in youth ministry, teenagers would sit in their, in the pew and they would pass notes to one another. And it was a problem at times because they'd be passing notes. But I didn't mind if they passed notes about, you know, making fun of me. But when they were making fun of each other or when they are talking about things, it totally, it really bothered me. That was one of the biggest things I had to deal with when I first started. Guess what? I don't have to deal with that anymore. Not because they're not passing notes, but because their notes are now on what? Their phones. I remember when they first started having phones and I was in youth ministry, is I could tell them that they always thought they were so slick because the girls, the boys couldn't do this. I don't know why the girls could do it, but the girls could make eye contact with me and still text something. It's a freakish gift that they had. They thought they were so slick, though, because they'd sit there and they'd pay a lot of attention to me, but they'd be down there texting. And I'm like, I know you're texting. You know how I know? Because it looks like you're paying attention to me. <laughs> I'm not dumb. Obviously, Jude didn't have to deal with anything like that. So we're constantly dealing with new things. But the way that we contend to the, uh, for the faith, that's the important part. This morning we're just going to take a couple minutes to focus on how Jude encourages people to contend for the faith. First way that he's going to mention that we'll look at in just a second is grow in the faith. Grow in the faith. That's our first point. And we find it in verse 20. What it says in verse 20. But you, beloved, build yourselves up in your most, in your most holy faith, and pray in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Stop there for a moment. First point, grow in the faith. Grow in the faith. What it really means is to become a disciple. Become a learner. Become one that's growing in the faith. Notice that he uses a great metaphor here of building. Building. You can't passively build something. I can't, I gotta, I gotta work on my deck at some point. My deck at my house is starting to get some big holes in it. In fact, it, it kind of is an, it, it's kind of an obstacle course when I, when I go out to get something on the deck. I kind of, I know where all the holes in the soft spots are, so I kind of move around them. My deck is at the point where it needs to be rebuilt. Guess what? I can't sit in my house and go, you know what? I really want that deck to get rebuilt. And then expect that it's gonna be done, right? Something has to happen, right? Yes. One of two things. I either have to do it myself, or I have to pay somebody else to do it for me. There's activity that goes on in there. We talk about building up the faith. There's activity that has to happen in our life. It certainly is a work of the Holy Spirit. We don't take the Holy Spirit's role out of it, but it takes active participation on the part of the believer. The Holy Spirit is the one that ultimately grows us, but we have to do something about it. Spiritual growth does not happen through osmosis. It's something that we have to actually put ourselves in a position. We have to take initiative. We have to do something about it. Nobody else will do it for you. You have to take initiative. As a church, we can help. And there are, there, there are really some the four key ways that the church helps when it comes to growth, but none of these work if we don't put ourselves in a position to actually take part in it. Let me share those four ways briefly. First, Sunday morning worship gatherings. This is usually our largest gathering as a church. When we come together, all that we do in the worship
worship service should celebrate and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. The teaching should come from the word. It's not a religious speech that touches its toe in scripture. It's driven by the word. As I said earlier, God's point becomes our purpose. So we spend adequate time studying God's word, seeing what God's word has to teach us. That's a great way to grow. But it's not the only way. It's usually a, an easy in, but there's others as well. Next, adult Bible study and Sunday school for youth and children. Very easy in this day and time to go, oh, i got to go to school all week. Why would I want to go to school on Sunday too? Oh. Actually, Sunday school and adult Bible study is a great opportunity to grow with other believers. Whether we're going through a book or a topic, it gives you an opportunity with a smaller group of people to not only study something, but hear what other people think. If we're only ever hearing what we think, then we'll be neutered in our thinking. It's important to hear what others think, but it's also important to have others in our life that we're encouraging and that are encouraging us. That we're challenging and are challenging us. You also get to find out about things of where you can help other people. Where you can minister to other people. New friendships and relationships are developed. Adult Bible study and Sunday school are a vital tool when it comes to discipleship. Next one is one that we've been practicing a lot over the last year in particular, uh, and it's smaller groups. Groups of three, four, five people that will get together. The example would be what our men's Bible study is doing right now. Right now we have groups of three or four that get together a couple times a month to dig pretty deep into a book. Right now we're doing the book of James. Gives us an opportunity to, 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 to really explore a book more closely and also throughout the months to challenge one another. To keep one another accountable. To help one another. To give understanding. Can't tell you how many times in these small groups we've had situations like you, you run into a scripture like, I don't really understand that. And somebody in that small group will probably be able to give some insight to be able to help so you'll have a better understanding. You go, oh, okay, now that makes more sense. I know the women have been practicing this for a while and they've got, uh, you know, there, there's some other groups that are beginning to build in there. Small groups is another great tool that we have when it comes to discipleship. And then finally, the most effective one is what we call mentoring relationships. One-on-one. -on -one. When somebody who's more mature in their walk spends time with somebody who's less mature in their walk. And don't be offended by that idea. Don't call me immature. We're all at some point in our life immature in our faith, right? We all can benefit from having somebody in our life who's walked with Jesus longer. I remember the first time I met a, a man named David Young. None of you probably know David Young, but David Young was a, pa a pastor up uh, at the church that April went to uh, when her and I got married. And I've been a pastor. I've been following Jesus. I'd even been in seminary for a while. But I'll tell you, when I sat with David Young and listened to him pray, I found myself going, I want to pray like that. This is a guy who's talking to God as if God is his best friend. This is a guy who clearly spends hours praying to God. And at the time I can say, you know what, I spend minutes praying with, to God. This is a man who's spending hours praying with, to God. We all could use that in our life. Having those mentors, those people that, that, that we draw near to, who, could, who, who also are not only going to give us a guide to give us an example to follow, but will also tell us what we need to hear that we don't want to hear. Many people today don't grow because we're not willing to put ourselves in a situation where somebody says, you're messing up here. You missed the point here. 
I remember one of the most effective relationships I had when it came to mentoring, uh, where my friend and I made this agreement with one another, that we would ask how things are going with a particular area uh, he was struggling with. And the question that I always asked him at the end of it, did you lie to me today? Did you lie to me today? Accountability is vital. Four things, mentoring, small groups, adult Bible study, uh, or, or Sunday school, worship gathering, all four of those will help you in your walk. All four of those are things that we should engage ourselves in. All four of those are things that are going to help us in this idea of building up in the most holy faith. Building oneself up in faith does not happen for a Lone Ranger Christian. Somebody says, I'll just do it on my own. Don't need the church. False. Church is one of the greatest blessings you could ever ask for. Why? Because the church stretches us. Church challenges us. Church puts us in a situation where we have to learn how to love others, even if those people are not as lovable as we would like them to be. Here's a little secret. You're not always as lovable as you would like the world to think you are. Amen. <clears throat> we don't need more Lone Ranger Christians. We need to be built up in the, the most holy faith. Next thing he says in verse 20 there is pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Holy Spirit. He says, building yourself up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Prayer is always linked to spiritual maturity. Prayer is always linked to spiritual maturity. You want to know how spiritually mature you are? How much have you prayed this week? I'll tell you a lot. If I asked you, what stood out to you, for those who knew her, what stood out to you about Verla Walston? I guarantee you, the word prayer would come out of your mouth. In fact, if you were here and you heard about her testimony, when she was dealing with, 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 with problems pertaining to her alcoholic husband, what did she do? She beat him over the head, right? No, she prayed for him. And God delivered him from his addiction. <clears throat> Notice that it says pray in the Holy Spirit. Let me mention what this isn't. Some people mistakenly mean, think that, oh, this means that you need to have some spirit or some secret prayer language or that you need to speak in tongues or something like that. That's not what he's getting at. He actually doesn't touch on that at all in this letter. He doesn't say one thing about it one way or another. When he talks about praying in the Holy Spirit, it means a prayer life that is guided by the Holy Spirit. It's not a self-centered or mechanical prayer, but it's an honest prayer. An honest prayer from the heart. An honest prayer that the Spirit is leading us to. You know what I found in my life? That my prayer life is the most powerful when I come to the end of my prayer list. And I just stop and I wait until God puts things on my heart. And every time I get to the end of my prayer list and I take the time and I say, I'm just going to stop and I'm just going to, I'm going to listen. God will put different people or situations on my heart. Nine times out of ten, I have no idea what's going on in those people's lives. Absolutely no idea. I don't know why God put that person on my heart. Do you know who does? The one I'm praying to. He knows. He knows why that person is on my heart. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Guided by the Spirit. Next, we abide in God's love. Abide in God's love. Look at verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Abide. Abide means stay. Holding fast. What it really means is to follow the commands of Jesus. To follow the commands of Jesus. We can't truly abide with Jesus when we're wallowing in sin. It's not going to happen. It doesn't mean that we're lost. It doesn't mean that he rejects us. It doesn't mean that we were once saved and now we're not saved anymore. That's not how that works. We're saved, but we're not abiding. Think about it this way. When does the sun shine? 
When does the sun shine? The day. But it's not cloudy. The sun shines all the time. 100% of the time the sun is shining. If the sun stopped shining, guess what? We'd stop living. It's that simple. Now we might not see the sun. Some of you who have lived in the Pacific Northwest are going, what is this sun thing you speak of? <laughs> when the clouds move away, that big hot thing in the sky, that's the sun. It's still there. It's there right now. We just can't see it because it's raining. At nighttime, still there, just on the opposite side of the world. The sun is always shining. Jesus is always there. We just allow the clouds of the world to get in the way. I love listening to books on tape. Uh, when I go on longer trips. Now, of course, it's not on tape anymore. It's all digitized. But I've got it on my phone, and actually the way that it works is that I have a little thing in my car that when uh, I'm listening to it on my phone, it actually through Bluetooth will go straight through that and play through the radio. So I just kind of just turn it on, and I can just listen to it right through the radio. It's great until I get down past Battleground. When I get down past Battleground down here, for whatever reason, the station that I'm listening to works perfectly fine. Nothing on that station for the, most of the time. But then all of a sudden, I start getting this static that comes in. And then all of a sudden, like, I'll, I'll get a song from Taylor Swift, and I'm like, ah! Back! And then I drive a little further, and it comes back. You know, a lot of times we allow the things of the world to cloud out the voice of Christ. The sin that we like to wallow in gets in the way. He's still there. He still loves us. He's still calling us back. But we're just wallowing in sin. The call here is to abide, to get back to where we need to, to, to repent, to turn away from these things, to reject these things, recognize that the sun is always shining. We just need to come back to it. Next, living in Christian hope. Living in Christian hope. Verse 21 says, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who leads to eternal life. Jude here is relating something that many believers miss out on today. We have a hope because Jesus is coming back to take us home. Amen? In Jude's day, like today, many people began to lose that hope because it hadn't happened yet. And we can get into that, 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 that thing, like, well, I don't know if it's going to happen. I'm not going to worry about it. Maybe it's not going to happen. I don't know. I give up. I take a little bit of a different approach on this. How long did it take God to create the world and everything in it? Six days, right? Okay. Six days and he rested on the seventh. Okay. All right. Remember one of the things that Jesus said. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will return again and bring you to myself. So if he created everything in six days... We've been here for over 2,000 years, and he's preparing a place for us. How great is heaven going to be? How great is heaven going to be? The reality is, is that we should always look forward. Could Jesus come back today? Yep. Could he come back tomorrow? Yep. Could it be 10 years from now? Yep. But the good news is this. He's going to. And that's where our hope is. Look at verses 22 and 23. It says, Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Last point is this. Practice evangelism and ministry. Practice evangelism and ministry. In these verses, we see two approaches to both evangelism and ministry. Both of them are there. These are not two separate things in, in, in the way that Jude approaches it. We evangelize and we minister to people. Two approaches that he says. Some need to be dealt with gently. Some need a gentle word. I met a young lady here just a couple days ago, and I invited her to, uh, to church, and she said that uh, she'd like to come, but she, she's afraid. 
She's afraid because she's been hurt by churches in the past. My response is, how dare you? How dare you say that about a church? No, I didn't say that. Of course I didn't say that. She didn't need somebody to judge her. She didn't need somebody to look down at her. She didn't need somebody to yell at her. She didn't need somebody to argue her about her experiences at church. But it says she got a gentle word. I said to her, I understand. I know a lot of people who have been hurt in churches before. And I know it's hard. But I encourage you to really think about maybe giving another church a chance. Maybe, maybe, maybe you'll find that there's something good for you. I can't promise you anything, but maybe you'll find something good there. Gentle word is always going, it was with, the, with certain people, are always going to work better than a harsh word. Others, though, need to be snatched out of the fire. Snatched out of the fire. Some people need to metaphorically be shaken, right? I would not recommend that's a good evangelism plan to actually literally shake people. Okay, don't really do that. But sometimes we need to be shaken. I was a guy in my life that I needed to be shaken. I needed to be snatched out of the fire. I was heading down a path that would have led to death and destruction. A gentle word was not enough. I was like the kid who was running to the street and a car was coming. Mom doesn't go, now Johnny boy, you might not want to do that. Cars hurt when they hit you. Does mom do, does mom do that? No, she says, stop! She yells out, why? Because her kid's in mortal danger. Sometimes we have to snatch people out. Sometimes we have to say hard words. Sometimes we have to say things that people won't like to hear. I was telling my daughter just the other day that if I wrote a book, I think that one of the books I would write would be called The Gift of Shame. The Gift of Shame. We hate shame in our world. We don't want to live in shame. But the reality is, is that God has given us the ability to feel shame over things that we shouldn't do. That we shouldn't be involved in. That are not good for us. Part of snatching out of the fire is understanding that that everything, I, what I'm doing right now might hurt me. What I'm doing may cause destruction, pain to other people. Sometimes we need to snatch people out of the fire. But here's a warning that he gives. In our attempts to reach people and to minister to them, don't allow yourself to fall into sin. Don't allow yourself to fall into sin. We can't say, well, i got to go reach these people, so I'm going to sin just a little bit, though, but I'll have my fingers crossed, and it really won't count. No, I love the way that Eugene Peterson wrote this in the message. He said this, he said, Be tender with sinners, but not soft on sin. The sin itself stinks to high heaven. How true that really is. Reaching the lost might call us to places we never thought we would go, but it will never call us to join people in their sin, ever. At no point will it do that. So here's the challenge. Are you contending for the faith? Can you say this morning, yes, I'm growing in my walk with Jesus. I'm praying consistently. I'm abiding in Christ. My hope is in Jesus' imminent return. And I'm consistently practicing evangelism and ministry. If that's you, praise God. But my feeling is that there are at least some, if not many, here this morning that would say, you know what? I could stand to grow in at least one of these areas. Or, or maybe two of these areas. Or maybe in all of these areas. If that's you, then this is a place for you this morning. All we need to do is commit ourselves to being a people who like those people who came before us, the Verlas, the Genies, the great saints throughout the Northwest Baptist Convention and right here in Castle Rock to follow the example that they set and contend for the faith. Look at each one of these points. Apply them to our lives. To how could God grow me through these? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity that you give us to come together to contend for the faith. And Lord, I pray that we would be a people 
who would consistently and persistently contend for the faith. Help us to follow you with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.